I feel like everyone's a little bit scared of getting kidnapped, but for Cynthia Anderson, she was paranoid. This 20-year-old woman was constantly harassed with scary anonymous phone calls and creepy love letters in the form of full-on wall murals. It was so bad, she had nightmares about getting abducted almost every night until one August day when her nightmare became a reality. Cynthia grew up in a devout Christian household with both parents. She was super committed to the Lord. Like she went to Sunday worship, prayer meetings, church swim meets, camping trips, the whole nine yards. She had plans to attend a Christian college in the fall of 1981. It was the same school her boyfriend attended. But sadly, Cynthia never made it there because two weeks before her first semester was supposed to start, she disappeared, like vanished, never to be seen again. So right now, it seems like nothing sketchy is going on. Maybe she just had enough of the religious lifestyle and wanted to run away and start a new life. I just can't see someone having something against a young Christian girl who was a legal secretary. Like everything about that seems pretty mundane. It's not like she's in the mob or something. But once we get into the story a bit more, things start to get suspicious. Let's see if we can figure out what happened. Cynthia was last seen on August 4th, 1981. That morning, she apparently skipped breakfast and left her parents' house around 8.30. She then drove to work, where she was last seen as late as 9.45 a.m. But no one knew she was missing until noon that day. Cynthia was always the first to show up and would often work alone in the mornings until her coworkers came around lunchtime. Okay, what law office allows their employees to show up at lunchtime? Isn't that weird? I feel like those jobs are the kind where you have to start at like seven in the morning, but whatever, not my business. On the day of Cynthia's disappearance, her coworkers showed up around noon and immediately knew something was off because they couldn't find Cynthia anywhere. They knew she had come in for work that morning because the lights, radio, and AC had been turned on, which was all a part of her morning routine. All of the mail had been put inside the front door and they even saw a book open on her desk. But the weird part about the book is it was a romance novel that only had one violent part in the whole story. And when Cynthia's coworkers found the book, it was open to that exact section, which talked about the main character getting abducted. Okay, that might just be a coincidence, but we've gotta be suspicious of everything at this point. Another weird thing to note about all of this is that the office was locked from the inside when Cynthia's coworkers arrived. Cynthia always kept the door locked when she worked alone in the mornings, so that would make sense. Except for the fact that Cynthia is missing from the office, but clearly was there that morning. And the alarm from the business next door never went off, which would have happened if someone tried to break in through the door. Uh, this is getting confusing. So maybe someone came in through the window or something? Or Cynthia escaped through the window herself? But Cynthia didn't leave a note or anything which is what she would typically do when stepping out of the office for a bit. At this point, Cynthia's coworkers were pretty concerned, so they called the cops. Officers arrived at the scene to check things out. Oh, there were no signs of forced entry or any sort of struggle. Based on her phone records, officials determined that Cynthia must have disappeared right before 10 a.m because she had answered all calls up until then. The only things that were missing, well, aside from Cynthia, were her purse and keys. But her car was still outside in the parking lot and it was locked. Officers notified Cynthia's parents about her vanishing and they were baffled. Her parents told officials that she wouldn't just disappear like that because she was raised in a strict religious environment. Okay, but how do they know that wasn't a reason she would want to run away? Like, maybe she didn't vibe with the Lord as much as her parents did. Parents don't always know everything about their kids, especially when they're 20 years old. Except for me. I tell my parents everything. During their interviews with the parents, investigators found out that Cynthia had put in her two weeks notice at work because she was about to go to Bible college with her boyfriend. Huh. 
that's interesting. Maybe someone at work was mad she was leaving and snatched her up? I mean, based on the sound of her co-workers, they seemed a bit lazier than her, so... Maybe they were mad that they might have to start coming in earlier for work. Something Cynthia's dad mentioned to investigators was that his daughter had recently become a little obsessed with her appearance. She was apparently wearing a lot more makeup and was dieting as well. Which doesn't seem that weird to me. Since Cynthia was about to go to college, she was probably just experimenting with her look. I did like the emo swoop once. You know, it's like the... I thought I looked hot. Officials then talked to Cynthia's sister, who brought up something freaky. She said Cynthia had a bunch of bizarre nightmares the whole year leading up to her disappearance. They were all about her getting abducted from her house and executed by a stranger. She apparently told her mom about all of her dreams, but her mom didn't do anything about it. Honestly, from what I've gathered about her parents, they were probably worried Cynthia's nightmares had something to do with the devil. And while it's scary she was having those nightmares, I don't understand how that would connect her to actually getting abducted IRL. Like, I feel like it may be a coincidence. Well, unless she was psychic or something, which isn't totally off the table. So all of this is already a bit odd, but just wait until you hear what was happening to Cynthia at her work before her disappearance. According to Cynthia's co-workers, she was getting harassed by an anonymous person who kept calling her phone that summer. No one really knows what the person was saying, but everyone who saw Cynthia when she would pick up the phone for these sketchy calls said she looked super terrified. One of the disturbing phone calls was made the day before she went missing. But again, her coworker who witnessed it said he had no idea what the call was about. Yo, I would be so panicked. Like, I even get freaked out when I get a spam call. And that's literally just an automated message. So it seems like someone was definitely out to get Cynthia, which probably made her nightmares even worse. Aside from the phone calls, some other strange stuff was going down at the law firm. A year before Cynthia went missing, someone painted I love you, Cindy, in super big letters on a wall outside her office. It was signed by GW. The creepy mural was right in the view of the window near Cynthia's desk. Everyone assumed this was about Cynthia because she went by Cindy for short and was the only one with that name on her side of the building. That is terrifying. Why did she not quit earlier? And I don't know if her stalker is trying to make a big romantic gesture or something, but I feel like there's definitely better ways to do that. I could see someone maybe writing her a note on a piece of paper or sending her flowers or something, but to paint a mural on the wall is way too far. Well, unless we're talking about a big flash mob proposal, but her boyfriend apparently didn't have anything to do with his painting. So it's looking more like a predatorial secret admirer. But things get even worse. The message was kept on the wall for six months until it was covered up. And then a few weeks later, someone wrote the same message again. This is getting out of hand. And why would they not paint over that for half a year? That had to be so frustrating for Cynthia to be constantly reminded of her stalker. So since the mural was signed by GW, investigators started to question a bunch of people with those initials. There was one maintenance guy with the initials who had access to the office, but there was no evidence found that could link him to Cynthia's disappearance. So due to all of this freaky stuff going on with Cynthia at work, her bosses actually got an emergency buzzer installed at her desk and told her to keep the office doors locked at all times. The buzzer was connected to the business next door, so if Cynthia ever hit it, an alarm would go off over there to call for help. But it never did the morning she vanished. Okay, if things were bad enough for Cynthia's employers to install an emergency buzzer, it seems like they should have let the police know or something. Or at least had her working when other people were there too. Like, why did they let her come in and work alone every morning? It's absurd. Or they could have possibly set her up to get abducted. Who knows at this point? Definitely not the investigators. 
So after all of their interviews, police were still unable to determine what happened to Cynthia and why she disappeared. One week after the event, the Toledo police received a startling phone call. An unknown woman told officials that someone had abducted Cynthia and was keeping her in her basement. But the woman never revealed her identity, address, or any other information about Cynthia. Whoa, that's crazy. I wonder why she would tell them that and not give them any more clues. And why would she let this person in her basement? That just sounds like she's asking to get abducted too. And maybe she did, which would make sense for ghosting the police after her first call. Okay, so investigators were probably more confused than ever at that point. And after the weird phone call, there were no real advancements made in Cynthia's case. Her social security number was never used by anyone, and her bank account was monitored by the police. But no charges were made after her disappearance. And she apparently had a lot of money, which could be another motive. Money is definitely a reason someone might want Cynthia gone. But then why wouldn't they withdraw anything from her account? That wouldn't make sense. Oh, and there was one other thing that came up in her case after the call. So I already told you about the maintenance guy with the GW initials who was at one point considered a suspect. Well, he was never tied to Cynthia's case, but the person who allegedly wrote the mural came forward later and said he wrote it for another woman named Cindy. Ugh, that's awkward. Because if it really was meant for another girl, Cynthia was put through so much emotional trauma for no reason. But how did they even determine if this guy was telling the truth? Well, the more time that passes, the more mysterious this whole thing gets. Now, it's been 40 years since Cynthia disappeared, and investigators still haven't determined what happened. At one point, they thought it could have been two guys named Richard and Jose. Richard was a lawyer who worked at the law firm when Cynthia disappeared. Jose was one of Richard's clients who just got caught for trafficking substances around that time. In 1996, Richard and Jose were both convicted for working together on a long time scheme involving illegal substances. Officials theorized that maybe Cynthia overheard the two men talking about their dope conspiracy and they snatched her up so she wouldn't rat them out. And when I say dope conspiracy, I'm talking about substances. I'm not describing it as cool. I just wanna clear that up. Well, apparently they even had a confession from Jose. At his trial in 1995, Jose said he was responsible for slaying Cynthia. He claimed he did it to send a message to Richard for not doing a good job representing him in court. The police were never able to validate this confession, so no charges have been made. But both Richard and Jose are still in jail for their trafficking charges. Okay, I'm no genius, but it sounds like Jose did it. I mean, he even said it himself. Like, what more do you need from a guy? I guess evidence, which investigators found none of, but still, it seems pretty obvious. Another possible suspect duo that police thought could have been involved were famous mass executioners and brothers, Anthony and Nathaniel Cook. Their slaying career was at its peak in the 80s, so everyone theorized they did it. But there was never evidence linking them to Cynthia's case. To this day, no one has been convicted or arrested for abducting Cynthia, and no hard evidence has come out to prove she really was snatched up, which is why some people still think she ran away. I mean, it seems like Cynthia's parents were super involved in her life, and at 20, I'm sure that was annoying for her. She also probably wanted a break from all of the church sessions, but then again, if she ran away, why wouldn't she spend any of her money? And how would that explain her stalker situation? That's why I still feel like it was Jose. Ugh, I don't know. This is all super confusing. For all I know, she could have run away to Louisiana to become a full-time gumbo taste tester. Okay, maybe that's just my stomach speaking. Good thing I have a bowl. Thanks for watching.